eat hot dogs and hamburgers, and there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that also. Uh, we also um, have a sign-up sheet for Kingdom Kids Summer Class. We're in need of teachers and helpers for that class. I also have a card to read that got left off this morning. It was inadvertently left on the shelf. Uh, no one to blame, David, but it got left off. It's usually attached to my uh, announcements, but it wasn't there this morning. Dear church family, senior night made me realize once again how special my church family is to me. Thank you so much for all the cards, gifts, and well wishes. No matter where I go, Henderson will always be my home. I love you all. Abby Salisbury. Those men leading us this, this evening, our opening prayer will be by Juan Nunez. Song leader will be Leland Steely. Scripture reading will be Will Salisbury. Bringing a lesson will be David Salisbury. And the closing prayer will be by Kenny Brantley. That is all the announcements we have for this evening. Two hundred thirty one. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Way down in Egypt, mid burning sand, a Moses. Had started before Canaan's land, I never turned backward, always ascend on to the journey's end. Hilltops of glory, I now can see. Oh, brother. Come go with me, safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand, hilltops of glory, footsteps of Jesus before us lead, oh, we tread life's journey, his warnings heed, evil allurements I cannot preach. I'm on the upward trail, hilltops of glory.
Bow with me, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble back again to give honor and glory to you for the blessings you give us, to worship in a way that we are able to hear your words and your message so we can strengthen our faith and apply them in our daily lives. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to be in a building where we can be in a controlled climate and be able to uh, worship together and pray for each other uh, as we're blessed, Lord, uh, knowing that uh, there are some that are suffering, going through some illness, some surgery, pray for them. And those that have lost loved one, that the uh, heart takes time to heal, we pray for the families. Father, we're grateful for today for Dr. Barnett, his service to many years, for his patience, for the community, for his family, and for our Christian family here in our church. Such an example for all of us to be disciplined in so many ways, in character, honesty, and integrity that he has set such a high standard for all of us. We continue to pray for his health. And Lord, we continue to pray for many that are on the prayer list. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to guide us as we face the challenges of each day. Forgive us of all our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.
Tonight's scripture reading is from Acts 11:26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Anywhere. Josh says it doesn't matter. Okay, good. It is good to be together tonight. Thank you for being with us. It's been a busy day uh, for us. Lots going on. And appreciate Juan remembering Dr. Barnett and the church and his prayers. We certainly thank Dr. Barnett for his service. And if you couldn't hear in his announcement this morning just how much he loves this church and loves serving this church, go back and listen to it again. And uh, he may be finishing up his time as an elder, but he's not done serving. We even talked this morning. We've got some ideas in mind for him, and he's going to continue to serve and work with us, and his wisdom will still be a blessing to us. On Sunday nights, we're going to take a look at, at who we are, just a, a couple of weeks here. And by the way, let me tell you, I am planning after VBS, we'll do a Sunday night lesson uh, coming up a couple Sunday nights after that, just a question and answer night. So if you've got some questions, and they can be any kind of Bible or church question, uh, leave the astrophysics alone. But beyond that, if you've got a question that you'd like me to answer, if you will, write that down and, and get that to me, text it to me, email it to me, or, or write it down, and I will uh, do my best to get to those. Josh and I have handled those together sometime. We may do that again here soon, but on a Sunday night here soon, I'm going to do a question and answer. So if you've got questions, let me know, and we'll put that together after VBS. Years ago, Heather and I were eating at a restaurant, and, and as was our habit, we got our food and sat down at the table, and, and we bowed our heads and had a prayer. There was a fellow a couple tables over who saw that, and he, he waited politely until we got done, and a, as we said, amen, he said, y'all must be some kind of Baptist. It's Baptists that always say a little prayer before they eat. And my first thought was, how do you respond to that? Well, what do you say? You know, he, he's appreciated what we did, but, but he's kind of asking who we are, where we go to church, and, and I just said, no, sir, we're just Christians. And, and, you know, as we talked about that, and maybe you've been in those conversations when somebody says, oh, you're just a Christian. Well, what kind of Christian are you? I'll always tell them I'm, I'm a Bible Christian. I think that's a good answer to give. But, but honestly, you, you say, well, how do we try to, try to pigeonhole what kind of Christian you are? We need to be able to know who we are. And when we want to talk about being Bible Christians and practicing what the Bible believes, we need to know how we talk about that. One way to summarize an early restoration movement teaching from both Alexander, Stone, uh, Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone was to say that, that we, we want to call Bible things by Bible names. Campbell would always say we want to use Bible terminology to speak about biblical things. But we just kind of summarize that. Call Bible things by Bible names. And another teaching that, that both Stone and Campbell gave was that we are not the only Christians. We're Christians only. We just want to be Christians. We don't want to add to that, oh, I'm of this kind or of that kind. We just want to be Christians. We want to read our Bibles and study our Bibles and do what we read there and follow the plan that's laid out there in, in its simplicity. So if we say we're Christians, it's worth saying, well, where do we find that in the Bible? Who are we? What does the Bible say about the identity of the church? And normally if somebody says, what are you religiously? We might even say Christian. It's the most common answer for folks who, who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior today that they would give is Christian. But that's a newer term. It is the least used title in the Bible for those who follow Jesus Christ. It's only used three times in all of Scripture. Twice, it's by non-Christians who were looking at that group and said, well, those people over there, they're those Christians. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 that Will read for us, it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They didn't call themselves that. Outsiders called them that. Said, oh, that, that, those folks down there, they're those Christian people. And that's confirmed by history. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote about the emperor Nero. And Rome burned while Nero was the emperor. And there's a lot of indication that Nero might have had something to do with the fire. 
And it happened in 64 AD, and folks got really upset, and, and there was a lot of chatter that Nero had set Rome on fire, and he decided he needed to deflect that blame. And Tacitus tells us that he decided to blame it on the Christians. Here's what Tacitus wrote. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Now, the Romans didn't speak Hebrew very well. It didn't translate into Latin very well. And, and so when they heard people call this guy Jesus Christ, they took Christ to be a last name. He's Jesus Christ. That's the son of Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. They had their little boy, Jesus Christ. And, and they used that as a last name. That's not how the word Christ is used. In Hebrew, Christ is a title that means he's Jesus the Messiah. But for the Romans, they said, oh, that must be his name. And so all of you that worship him, y'all are those Christ people. You're the Christians. And that's what the populace called those who worship Jesus. Now, you need to know the church took that name. And though it was originally given as kind of a pejorative name and, and kind of to make fun of them, Nero used it as one that justified calling them some kind of a separate class of citizens. The church decided to wear that name as a badge of honor. Yeah, we'll be Christians. Yeah, we'll wear the name of Jesus Christ. We'll wear it proudly. We'll, we'll serve him. We don't mind identifying that as all, at all. But originally, Christian simply referred to which God you worshipped. You were a Christ follower. And so that title was not what they called themselves. So tonight we're going to look at a couple of names that the church called themselves. And next week we'll look at a few more. The most common name in scripture for the church is saints. And Paul used it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I could have picked a lot of different verses. The word saint describes Christians 61 times just in the New Testament alone. But now we tend to think of a saint as some kind of a stained glass hero, some kind of a super Christian who, who does fantastic, wonderful things, who reads their Bible all the time, prays 27 times a day, and, and knows all this stuff about Scripture. And they're all, that's how the world thinks of a saint, a super Christian. But Paul uses it. In fact, in all of his letters but three, Paul uses it to describe the whole church, that, that we are saints. He says, in Jude, or Jude says that the faith was once and for all delivered to the saints. Who is it that receives the faith? It's the church. But Jude says it's the saints. All Christians are saints. Which means it would be perfectly appropriate if we walked in and, and said, well, hey, you know, tonight leading our singing will be St. Leland. And Leland's going to be leading our, our singing, and, uh, you know, we're, we're glad to have our, our elders with us, St. Bob and St. Rodney, and, and the truth is, we could talk, you know, we, we could talk about our ladies and say, here's St. Lynn and St. Rhonda and St. Janice and St. Marcia, and we're, we're saints. We could do that. That's a title that the church used to describe themselves. But because of the way the world's used it, we've kind of stepped away from that, and maybe we'd even say, I don't know if I want you to call me a saint, but the Bible, it's the most common word for the church. Paul told the Ephesians that God gave the church apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers for the express purpose of equipping the saints. They're not the super Christians. They're the ones that need to be taught and equipped and grow in the faith. It's the church. It's the whole church. The word saint translates the Greek word hagios. It means the holy ones. Saints are those who have been sanctified. They've been set apart. God says, these are my people, and he sets them apart from all the rest of the world. So what does it mean, if that's the word, what does it mean to be a saint? How, how do you and I live as saints? Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Remember, that's our same word there. His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Peter says we're set apart to God. We are a holy nation. He, he looks at us and, and Christians all over the world, and we are saints. 
To be set apart to God means I place myself in a unique relationship with him. I say, you are, the, you are my God. I worship you. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And, and it means that I answer to his holiness. And Peter says, you want to know, and, and as he writes to a, a mostly Jewish audience there, he says, let me tell you how this works. You are, and Peter says, you are a holy priesthood, or a royal priesthood there. The, the priests were regular men that God made holy. The tribe of Levi was one tribe amongst all the tribes of, of Israel. And after a specific incident where they proved their dedication to God, he said, I will take you and set you aside. And the tribe of Levi, it, it'll be from the tribe of Levi that the priests come, from Aaron's family. And so priests were regular men, but there was a process. In fact, God gave Moses, here's the rules. Here's what you do with Aaron and his sons to make them holy. God called them to serve as priests. To serve as a priest was a high calling in the Old Testament. And Peter turns around and he says, if you're a Christian, you're part of a royal priesthood. You've been called to serve God. Every single Christian and so when a priest became a priest, the first thing they did was they acknowledged their sinfulness and then they took care of it. Moses offered a sacrifice for the sins of the priest to purify them, to make them holy. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 reminds us that we too have been made holy by the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so all of us are called to serve God. And Peter says, just like those priests were regular men that God made holy, so we have been made holy. But don't take that lightly. Peter says, here's what it means to live holy. In verse 15 and 16 of chapter 1, he says, He who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. See, we've got our standard, our ideas of what a saint is and what, what it means to live a holy life. But Peter reminds us that God's holiness is the standard we live by. That, that God's holiness is how we define it. We're not compared to anybody else. It's not how well I do compared to you or you or you. It's not how I measure up against the greats of all time or the greats of my day. It's how I measure up to God. I've told this story to some of you before, but when I was a senior in high school, the guidance counselor realized that I was half a credit short in PE, and I couldn't graduate. And I was in the midst of taking all my senior year classes, and there wasn't a spot that I could fit PE in. And so they said, you know what? The eighth graders have a PE class that meets during your lunch period. So if you'll agree to skip lunch, you can go to eighth grade PE and take that for half a year. You'll get your half credits. You can graduate. So six foot two me walks into eighth grade PE. And the teacher says, welcome to PE. We're going to do two sports this semester. We're going to study and play volleyball and basketball. And uh, even said, we may lower the goals a little bit to make it a little easier for you to play basketball. And I thought, this is going to be a cakewalk. Man, I looked like an all-pro basketball player. Never mind, I'd been cut from the junior high team when I was in junior high. But put me up against a bunch of eighth graders, and I looked like Michael Jordan. It, it was incredible. But, you know, you can't compare me just to eighth graders. I could look around and say, boy, I'm a great basketball player, but I was comparing myself to the wrong standard. Put me up against Michael Jordan, and you'd say, yeah, that kid got cut in junior high. So Peter reminds us, it's not about looking around and trying to stack myself and say, well, I, I'm, you know, compared to everybody around me, I'm a pretty good person. Be holy as I am holy. God is the standard. Being better than the folks around you doesn't make you a good person or a holy person or anything else. It's living up to the standard that God sets for us. And that means we're different. To be holy means we've been called out of the world. We don't live like the world. In fact, Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. He says, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for, and there's our word, saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather 
giving of thanks. Paul, what's it mean to live a life of a saint? Well, Paul says living by a different standard means our lives look different from the world around us. Stuff that the world does regularly shouldn't even be named among God's people. How I handle my morality, it matters. How I manage relationships, it matters. What, what I do with my money, it matters. How I act at work, it makes a difference. Being a Christian changes the very way that I talk around other people. All of that speaks to my relationship with God. See, when we're holy, when we're set apart, we live a holy life. To be a Christian is to be a saint, to live that godly life. It means that we live in a way that's different, noticeably different from the world around us. That's what it means to be a saint. The second most common word that's used in the New Testament to describe the church is a disciple. In fact, it's used 25 times just in the book of Acts. In the reading that we had, it said the disciples were first called Christians. They called themselves disciples before they were called Christians. A disciple, the Greek word there is methetes, it just simply means a student. But it's not a student like you were a student in English class where you just kind of determined, hey, I'm going to try to study the material and do what the teacher says to do so I can get a grade and pass this class and hopefully never see this teacher again. To be a disciple, to be that kind of a student, it says I'm devoted, first of all, to one teacher. The Jewish model was that, that you would become a disciple of one teacher and you stayed with them through all of your educational process. You would graduate from their school. Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. He, he sat at Gamaliel's feet for all of his education. And to be a disciple didn't just mean I'm going to learn what this teacher teaches and pass their test. It said, I want to be like my teacher. I, I want to be like them. When I grow up, I want to be just like them. It's a student who was devoted to their teacher. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, I had a lot of teachers in school that I, I wanted to pass their class, but I didn't really want to be like them. That's not what Jesus is talking about. To be a disciple, it says, I want to be like them in everything. That's what it means to, to really be a disciple, to study, to, to follow. We are learners. We practice our faith. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect at it. We are learners. We're students. Jesus regularly looked at his disciples and he would say, oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you have no faith? They were still struggling. They were still learning. Even late in his ministry, Philip says, show us the Father and it'll be enough. And he says, Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't understand? They still had stuff to learn, even near the end of their time together with Jesus. But as we continue to improve till we are fully trained, we grow the English word disciple comes from the Latin that has the same root word as discipline. And those are, those are tied together. To be a disciple takes work. To say, I want to follow after my teacher, I want to be like my teacher, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes discipline to be a disciple. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. He says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul says, I've still got work to do. Even though I'm up here preaching, even though I'm leading people to Jesus, I continue to discipline my body. I continue to bring it into subjection. What he means there is, I can't just do what I want to do. I still serve God every day and I grow in my faith. Being a disciple means living that disciplined life. You know, it's not easy to be a Christian it's not that, that, oh, it just comes naturally to us, but anybody can do the work that's required if they're willing. Discipline is to decide, hey, I, I'm going to consistently do the right thing. Discipline says, I'm going to read my Bible. I, I'm going to do my King's copy. Discipline says, I'm going to take and set, a set aside a time to pray. Discipline says, when I, when I have money that comes in, I'm going to give as I've been prospered. Discipline says, I'll be at church on a Sunday night. Way to go you. I'll be at church on a Sunday night. When the saints are gathered, when the doors are open, I'll be there. Discipline is part of the Christian life. And all phases of the Christian life require us to be disciplined. To, to make those choices, to continue to renew our faith, to say each time, I'm going to do the right thing. 
And so it's appropriate to call us disciples, those disciplined ones, those ones who are studying and learning. But we have to live those kind of lives. Being a disciple means I'm going to live a disciplined life. So if those are the ways that the early Christian decide, uh, described themselves, and we want to do what they did, we want to call Bible things by Bible names, then we ought to ask ourselves, who are, who are we? It's a fair question. Somebody says, what kind of Christian are you? Well, I'm a saint. I'm a disciple. So how you doing? How you doing with that saintly life? Will you be a saint? Will you live a holy life? You are a saint if you're a Christian. You've been set aside to God. He's called you by his name. He's added you to his family. He's adopted you as his child. He's set you apart as his church. The, the very word church, the called out ones, those who have been called out by God. If you're a Christian, you've accepted his invitation to become part of the family of God. And he's the standard. His holiness is the standard. It's not just being better than the people around you. It's not looking down your nose and saying, well, at least I'm not as bad as you are. It's saying, I want to be like Christ. I want to do what Christ would do. I want to think what Christ would think and feel what Christ would feel and say what Christ would say. It affects everything about me. I live according to a different standard. And so I handle my morality and my ethics I handle the way I dress and the way I talk. I handle what I watch and what I listen to. I'm set apart from the world because I belong to Jesus. I'm a saint. And I'm a disciple. I'm still studying and learning. We talked this morning in our Bible class. There's a humility about being a student. James says we receive with humility, with meekness, the implanted word. I have to say I don't know it all. I don't have all the answers. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And that might even include sometime having to say, I was wrong. And I've been corrected by my study of the word of God. Now I understand the truth more perfectly and I'm growing. But more than just study, James says it's important to embrace the life that Jesus called us to live. And so the invitation is pretty simple tonight. Would you like to be a saint? Would you like to be a disciple? God invites you to do that. It's not a commitment to be taken lightly, but neither is it a question you can avoid. Who are you, really? Whose are you? And maybe tonight it's time to make that commitment to say, you know what, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. I'm going to become a Christian tonight. Tonight I will repent of my sins. I'll confess my faith in Jesus as the Son of God. I'll be baptized to have my sins washed away. God will add me to the church, and I'll take that next step of commitment to God that begins my life of service to him as a saint, as a disciple. Or maybe tonight you made that commitment. Maybe tonight you'd say, yeah, I took that step. I can remember that day, but I haven't lived like a saint. I haven't been disciplined in my discipleship. And tonight you say, I need to live like who I am. Paul tells the Ephesians, walk worthy of the calling you've received. And so maybe tonight you look at your life and you say, I got to fix the way I'm walking. I need to walk with Jesus. I need to get back in step with the Spirit. Maybe tonight it's time for you to get your life right with God, to become a Christian, or to come back to the Lord. If we can help you, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?
Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the message that you've given us, that we may take it out into our daily lives and our workplaces and live like disciplined Christians. Be with Fred Barnett and all those that work in this church, Father, to conduct services and teach classes, that we may continue to grow stronger and find them strong Christian people that Fred was talking about. Because this church harvests good men and good women that help to serve it. We do all these things, dear God, in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.